Time with Electron. In the pre-dawn silence of July 10th, 1969, the Royal Mail ship Picardy cut through the Atlantic's vast emptiness, far removed from civilization. Captain Richard Cox, steering the ship at coordinates 33 degrees 11 minutes north and 40 degrees 28 minutes west, noticed an anomaly on the horizon, a small, seemingly abandoned boat. Despite attempts to hail the vessel with flares, flags, and horn blasts, there was no response. Cox's decision to dispatch a boarding party unveiled a ghostly scene, an empty boat that bore signs of a recent habitation, but hauntingly devoid of life. Though they initially assumed that the vessel's occupant had experienced a tragic accident, the logbooks discovered told a deeper, more shocking tale. The journey of the Tynemouth Electron, a custom-built trimaran, embarked from Tynemouth Harbor, England, on October 31st, 1968. At its helm was Donald Crowhurst, an electronics engineer and amateur sailor, with ambitions of triumphing in the inaugural around-the-world yacht race, known as the Sunday Times Golden Globe Race. Crowhurst, who had devised a moderately successful marine navigation aid, possessed a deep theoretical understanding of sailing, but lacked extensive hands-on experience. Facing financial difficulties with his business, he viewed the race as an opportunity to spotlight his navigational device. Despite his lack of seafaring experience, Crowhurst had poured his ingenuity into building the Electron. He equipped it with numerous, albeit unfinished, safety innovations meant to navigate the globe's most treacherous waters, including the southern passages of Africa and South America. Yet, almost immediately, the reality of his perilous undertaking became apparent. Time constraints and a lack of funding meant that almost none of the safety features were ready when Crowhurst set sail, and his idea of finishing them during the journey quickly proved foolish. Due to his lack of open ocean sailing experience, Crowhurst's voyage quickly transformed from an adventurous quest to a desperate struggle for survival. By November, he acknowledged his grim odds in the ship's logs, estimating only a 50-50 chance of survival, even if his safety mechanisms could be made operational before sailing into the dangerous Southern Ocean. With his life savings and his very existence bound to the Electron, Crowhurst hatched a desperate plan. Instead of continuing around the Horn of Africa, he aimlessly sailed around the South Atlantic, filing false location logs and keeping his radio switched off. He intended to wait near South America for several months before rejoining the other racers during their final leg back to England. He initially filed false log reports to indicate record-setting and attention-grabbing progress before devolving into more vague positional reports. Crowhurst would ultimately keep two different logbooks, one intricately detailing his claimed progress and a secret log with his actual positions and insights into his state of mind. His deception soon became dangerous. Another racer, Nigel Tetley, believed he was neck and neck with Crowhurst for the competition's prize. Pushing his boat past its limits in an effort to keep up, Tetley was forced to abandon his sinking ship on May 30th, 1969. During his time in the South Atlantic, Crowhurst's mental state rapidly frayed under the weight of guilt and the dread of exposure upon his return to England. His journal entries, a window into his deteriorating psyche, ceased on July 1st, 1969. Specifics around his demise remain unknown. His logs hint that he may have drowned himself to become a cosmic being, but the truth remains as elusive as the man himself. MV Arctic Sea In the summer of 2009, an unprecedented piracy case, unparalleled since the era of Blackbeard, captured global attention. Diverging from the typical locale of modern pirate attacks, this incident unfolded far from the Somali coast. It did not involve hostages, ransoms, or a dramatic rescue operation, nor did it include cargo worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Instead, the event curiously occurred in the North Sea, featuring only a modest cargo of lumber, valued at a million British pounds, and a ship over 700 feet long that mysteriously disappeared for two weeks. On July 23, 2009, the MV Arctic Sea departed Finland, laden with timber bound for Bajaya, Algeria. The following day, an alarming turn of events took place. Ten armed men in black boarded the vessel, assaulting the crew before restraining them and seizing every valuable item that was not secured. The sequence of events that ensued remains shrouded in mystery. After the boarding, the Arctic Sea vanished from all forms of communication. A brief radio message on July 29th suggested the ship was navigating through the Straits of Dover, seemingly without any issues. However, when the ship failed to arrive in Algeria as scheduled, 
Russia, alongside several other nations, deployed naval forces to locate the missing vessel. Remarkably, a week beyond its expected arrival, Russian ships discovered the Arctic Sea off Cape Verde, thousands of miles off course from its intended destination. From this point, the case's complexity only intensified, leaving more questions unanswered. When the vessel was finally located, no hijackers were found on board, and the crew's behavior suggested nothing unusual had transpired. Intriguingly, the hijacking report to the Coast Guard was only filed ten days after the incident. Adding to the confusion, Malta, where the ship was registered, later confessed to being aware of the ship's location throughout the ordeal, a fact they concealed to prevent exacerbating the situation. Although authorities eventually apprehended the pirates after the ship's recovery, any statements from the pirates remain undisclosed. The truth may never be revealed, and the world may only be left to wonder what transpired on the Arctic Sea during its mysterious two-week journey in 2009. The Monster of UB-85 During the First World War, German submarines, known as U-boats, patrolled the North Atlantic, targeting Allied ships within their domain. On April 30th, 1918, an unusual encounter unfolded when the naval traveler Coriopsis II came across and fired upon SMUB-85 under the command of Captain Gunter Kreck. The U-boat surrendered to the British vessel without firing a single shot back. The reason, as Kreck later revealed, was as fantastical as it was unbelievable. A sea monster had incapacitated his submarine. Kreck recounted that, on the night of April 29th, his crew faced an unimaginable horror. While surfacing to recharge the batteries, a standard practice for submarines of the time, an enormous beast emerged from the depths. Described with horns, massive teeth, and a bulk so immense it caused the U-boat to list as it crawled over the vessel, the creature attacked UB-85, tearing into its forward gun and breaching the hull. This damage rendered the submarine incapable of submerging or defending itself, leading to its swift surrender upon encountering the Coriopsis II. The veracity of Kreck's account was met with skepticism, yet the British took no chances, scuttling UB-85 to the ocean floor. Despite being pressed by German naval authorities, Kreck remained steadfast in his extraordinary claim. For decades, the wreck of UB-85 lay in the Irish Sea, silent evidence of an unresolved mystery. However, the discovery of the wreckage in 2016 shed new light on the events. Contrary to Kreck's tale of a monstrous encounter, Evidence suggested a far more mundane cause of UB-85's demise, a catastrophic failure due to human error and a monstrous level of incompetence on the part of the vessel's captain. The subcommander had demanded that he have a heater in his cabin, and the power cords had to be threaded through the watertight doors of the submarine and connected to a power source. When the Coriopsis was first sighted, Crack's order to dive was undermined by his failure to ensure all the outer hatches were sealed shut, and water immediately began to flood into the U-boat. The internal watertight doors were sealed, except for the one obstructed by the cords running from Kreck's heater. Unable to escape and too full of water to fight, UB-85 was forced to surrender. This revelation paints a picture not of mythical beasts, but of a commander's negligence. Yet the allure of the sea monster story persists, capturing imaginations and fueling speculation despite the historical record's clarification. Lifeboat to the End of the World On April 6, 1964, amidst the vast, unforgiving expanse of the South Atlantic, the British ice vessel HMS Protector embarked on a peculiar mission. Tasked with scouting Bouvet Island for a suitable site to build a weather tower, this remote and inhospitable landmass was about to unveil a mystery as bewildering as its own existence. Amidst the icy desolation, they stumbled upon an anomaly that defied explanation, an abandoned lifeboat adrift in a secluded lagoon on the world's most isolated landmass. This discovery would puzzle and haunt them, sparking a mystery with no definitive resolution. Bouvet Island, a stark territory of glaciers and sheer ice cliffs, is a place where few dare to venture. Its remoteness is unparalleled, far from any sign of civilization, over a thousand miles from Antarctica's coast and even farther from the nearest inhabited lands. First discovered in 1739 by French explorer Jean-Baptiste Charles Bouvet de Lozier, the island remained unclaimed until the British Empire annexed it in 1825, only to be claimed by Norway in 1927. The HMS Protector's crew knew the risks and challenges of such a place, yet nothing could prepare them for the sight of a lifeboat 
eerily out of place in a recently formed lagoon. The lifeboat bore no signs of its origins or the fate of its occupants. Its presence was a mystery, compounded by the absence of personal belongings, save for a pair of oars on the shore, alongside a flattened copper tank and a barrel. Despite a thorough search, Lieutenant Commander Crawford found no trace of a campsite or evidence of human habitation. The island, as unforgiving as it was remote, offered no clues. The mystery deepened with the revelation that an American expedition just seven years prior had made no mention of the lifeboat. This discovery led to numerous speculations and investigations, none more intriguing than the findings of independent researchers on the internet. A particular account from the Soviet science vessel Slava 9's log, captured in the book Transactions of the Oceanographical Institute, suggested a possible explanation. A group of sailors had landed a boat on Bouvet Island in 1958, only to be stranded due to worsening weather and subsequently rescued by helicopter. This account offers a tantalizing glimpse into the lifeboat's origins, yet questions linger. Was this the same lifeboat discovered by the HMS Protector, or does it signify a different, untold story of survival or despair? With its silent, icy embrace, Bouvet Island keeps its secrets well. Orang Madan It was a distress signal no sailor ever wants to hear, yet in 1948, it pierced the calm of the Silver Star's voyage like a cold shiver through the spine. Through the crackle of Morse code, a message of doom emerged from the SS Urang Madan, a Dutch ship adrift in the treacherous straits of Malacca near Malaysia. The message was stark, haunting, and final. Quote, All officers, including captain, dead, lying in chart room and on bridge. Probably whole crew dead. I die. Driven by a mix of duty and dread, the Silver Star's crew set a new course, aiming to reach the Orang Madan, which lay ominously fifty miles away. What they discovered upon arrival was a scene straight out of a mariner's worst nightmare. The entire crew of the Orang Madan was dead, their faces frozen in unspeakable terror, bodies untouched by visible wounds. Before any clues could be found, a mysterious fire erupted in the number four cargo hold, leading to a series of explosions. The Orang Madan sank swiftly, taking with it any hope of understanding the bizarre tragedy. Speculation about the Orang Madan's fate has ranged from the sinister, such as rumors that the ship was carrying a secret cargo of lethal nerve gas left over from World War II, to the more mundane yet equally tragic possibility of carbon monoxide poisoning from a faulty boiler. However, the mystery doesn't stop at the cause of death or the nature of the catastrophic explosions. The very existence of the SS Orang Madan is a puzzle. Despite the dramatic SOS and the chilling tale of death at sea, the incident didn't make it into official records until six years later, courtesy of a Coast Guard report. A CIA document also mentions the ship in its eerie final message, but how and why the CIA became involved is another riddle. No shipping registries acknowledge the Orang Madan, and there's no verifiable evidence that the Silver Star ever received the distress call or attempted a rescue. The story of the Orang Madan lives on through whispers and conjecture. This ghost ship has challenged the boundary between fact and folklore. If the SS Orang Madan did indeed navigate the waters of the Straits of Malacca, the secrets of its voyage, the deaths aboard, and the subsequent sinking remain submerged beneath the waves. The mystery of the Orang Madan is not just a question of what happened, but if it happened at all. Which of these mysteries at sea has the most intriguing explanation? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.